into your hats. We've got an interview coming up here that hopefully is going to uh, shed a lot of light on, on some of the issues that I've been putting up on the website here. Sp more, more specifically, we have, we have a gentleman here who has uh, several decades of research and, and efforts being pl placed by him uh, to expose the criminality within this uh, Zionist, um, well, Illuminati, we've got a lot of names for this stuff, but World Zionism and uh, Rothschild conspiracy is one, the one I'd like to call it. Uh, his name is Eustace Mullins. He's, he's, boy, he's been attacked by everybody, uh, front, right, and center. And, uh, geez, you know something, Eustace, I can, I can understand how that feels, boy, because they're attacking me right now like you have no idea. Well, when they come after you, they give you everything they got. Well, they have been. I get it from both sides. I get it from, from other uh, websites and people. It's, it's fine because, obviously, I'm making a difference or they wouldn't be doing it. Oh, absolutely. Well, here's the interesting thing. I mean, I, I've, I've been reading... Uh, Benjamin Friedman's work, and you knew Ben Friedman, and uh, he, sp he spent a great deal of his own money and a lot of time on trying to get people to pay attention to these issues, and he was not very successful because he couldn't get the airplay he wanted, and so his tape, or his, his uh, record that he made, kind of fell by the wayside over the years, the 1961 uh, interview and, that he did over in, in, in a Washington hotel. It's resurfaced, and it's, it is powerful in, in what it talks about and how these people um, manipulated the last century uh, to create war, uh, famine, destruction, uh, enmity, and, and criminality throughout our world. And I want to I know what your personal relationship was, was with, with Mr. Friedman, and, and is, was he as credible as I think he was? Oh, he was absolutely credible. In fact, his work has lasted. That, that is a great test of all, the test of time. And uh, I see more Friedman stuff around now than when he was alive. Well, he, he deserves a lot if, uh, if, you know, most of the things that I've been able to check on, and I can't check on everything, but everything that I have checked on seems to check out. And oh, my God. Ben, ben was a real scholar. Well, he did. He was a, intellectual. Yeah, he did a good job. And here's, here's what he said. He was there in, in the 1916 meeting with, with um, Untermeyer and, uh, and I guess, who else did they send? Um, Baruch and uh, Morgenthal and a whole group of very, very high-placed uh, Jews from New York City and across the country to come to Britain and convince them uh, that uh, they, if they fought for, that, for a, a homeland in Palestine after World War I, they would get America committed to the, to the World War I fight. And that, that seems to make sense to me and anybody who looks at it. Is, what's your take on all that? Well, it was quite a movement. Uh, it was quite a movement to get America into the war. You say America was isolationist, had no interest in the European war. And uh, it did look like uh, they were going to get into World War I. And if, if World War I would have been a total bust if uh, they had gotten America into it, because it would have been a, lot, a small local a war in Europe, it wouldn't have done any good at all for the conspirators. So they had to get us in, and Woodrow Wilson is the man that they uh, chose to do it. Well, the, the, I hear that uh, Justice Brandeis may well have had a hand in blackmailing him. Uh, there is some evidence of that. I haven't seen it personally. What do you know about that? Oh, yes, the Peck letters. You see, uh, they blackmailed uh, Wilson into uh, uh, appointing Judge Brandeis uh, on the Supreme Court. And uh, Justice Brandeis was also the head of the World Zionist Organization. So you know where his real uh, sympathies lay. So uh, after Brandeis got in, uh, he may he opened the door for Baruch, uh, Bernard Baruch to become uh, Wilson's uh, czar of the War Industries Board. Uh, Baruch had total control over every industrialist in the United States. He boasted in uh, 1932 testifying before Congress that he had more power than any person in the history of the United States. Bernard, uh, Bernard Baruch, the, 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 they named the, uh, the City University of New York after him, didn't oh, they? Oh, yeah, the Bernard Baruch uh, uh, Business College. That's right, they did. Uh, it was right up the street from my university, and I, I remember that. Anyway, he, he, here's the interesting thing. They didn't stop there. In the 30s, what they found out was that uh, they hadn't sufficiently uh, destroyed Germany and, and the terms of surrender after World War I didn't seem to be painful enough because the Germans were on to their little uh, scheme, according to Mr. Friedman. So what, he decided, what they decided to do was create 
a, 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 an economic boycott against Germany that forced the nation almost into starvation in the early 30s. Am I correct? Oh, uh, that's correct. You see, World War I and World War II were caused solely by the fact that Great Britain couldn't compete with German quality. And uh, that, was, that was driving by great England off the world market. So England faced their economic uh, collapse. They had to destroy Germany, and it took them two world wars to do it. And now Germany is under complete control. Germany, uh, the, the nation of Germany today is ruled by the uh, uh, German Marshall Plan out of New York City. Germany has had no government since 1945. And it's still this way, yeah. Oh, yes. Well, here's, so here's the interesting thing. Uh, what they said was the German people actually caught wind of this uh, conspiracy and uh, felt some personal enmity toward uh, Jews, but they did not strike out against them, did they? No, no, indeed. In fact, George Sylvester used to tell me a joke. He said there was a, during the uh, 1920s, there was a long uh, parade through Berlin uh, of Nazis carrying the signs down with the Jews, down with the Jews, and at the end of the program, at the end of the parade came two uh, Jew, the Jew, Jewish bankers who were paying for the whole thing, uh, Max uh, Warburg and uh, Max Oppenheimer. And so they carried signs down with us. Down with us. Oh, very got a great sense of humor. Europeans do have a good sense of humor. They have much more humor about politics than we do. Well, the, the bottom line was uh, that, that the buildup after the 1932-33 uh, battle for the chancellery, which, uh, of course, um, Hitler was able to take from his, uh, his, well, actually, he killed his way into it, from what I understand. But he was financed, his war machine, his buildup, was financed by these bankers, wasn't it? Oh, yes. Max Warburg and uh, Max, Max Oppenheimer financed everything. And they put apart a mythical story that uh, German industrialists had financed Hitler. Which wasn't true. The German industrialists uh, didn't like him, and they had nothing to do with him. All of his money <coughs> came from Jewish bankers, which uh, created the paradoxical situation that you had an anti-Semitic government, which was uh, attacking the Jews, and it was all financed with Jewish money. Well, now at the time, were, was anybody aware over the? You know, was this was this above board, or was this kind of clandestine financing? Oh, this was clandestine. In fact. Uh, I only came, uh, came into it years later after World War II. George Sylvester Beer told me a lot of it. See, he was the Ill illegitimate son of uh, Kaiser Wilhelm I. Who was? Uh, George Sylvester Beer. He represented Germany during both world wars. I used to kid him, but he, he called Germany victory in both world wars, and he, he was quite flattered when I told him that. And was he from the same Zionist uh, camp? Oh, no, no. He, he was old European aristocracy. Ah, uh, okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, when we come back, I got a few a few other questions about uh, Mr. Friedman, and then I want to uh, move over to Mr. Untermeyer, you know, as well as uh, Mr. Fagan. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, when we return, we have uh, a great resource in Eustace Mullins. Stick with us. And, ladies and gentlemen, we're back. Daryl Bradford Smith, your host today. I've uh, got a great interview going on, uh, but to uh, give you my uh, details here, I am the witness com is the website. And uh, these subjects we're talking about are all available on that site, including Benjamin Friedman, Samuel Untermeyer's uh, transcript, as well as uh, Myron Fagan's work. We're going to go back to Ben Friedman's work here. He talks about um, the World War II, uh, the destruction and, and all of the things that happened in World War II, being designed um, in order to, uh, to get an exodus of the Jewish community from Europe. In other words, there was no event that was going to get them to migrate to the Middle East, to Palestine, and that these, these uh, people, these megalomaniacs in charge, uh, came up with a scheme that by um, having this, this hatred uh, generated against the Jewish community, somehow they would get an exodus of this community, and by and large it worked, didn't it? That these, these uh, people, these megalomaniacs in charge, uh, came up with a scheme that by um, having this, this hatred uh, generated against the Jewish community, somehow they would get an exodus of this community, and by and large it worked, didn't it? Oh, yes. In fact, uh, Hitler was uh, recruited by the World Zionist Organization in 1923. He had this whole movement in uh, Germany. It wasn't going anywhere, and the World Zionist uh, 
organization uh, cut, cut a deal with him in 1923. Uh, they joined and worked together, and uh, that's how the Nazi Party was created. So you see, the Holocaust itself was created entirely in the Jewish community. The rest of the world uh, had no problem with Jewish people whatsoever. Well, their, their goal, though, was, was to get uh, a population of them to get back into Palestine and, and then to exercise that Balfour um, agreement they had, uh, they had made with the British so that a homeland could be established. Uh, to what end was this being done? What, why were they trying to set up this homeland, Eustace, in your view? Well, uh, they figured this homeland was at the crossroads of the world and that it would control the entire world. That's what it was about. It was about world of domination. They weren't just looking for a homeland for the, the Jewish people. They were looking to dominate the world. Are you could do it from the crossroads of the world in Palestine. Is there, are there religious to overtones to this? Uh, I have never found any religious overtones in everything. Everything is practical politics. Everybody's after money and power. Uh, I, I haven't run into religious people at all. You have, and, and, but they do use religion as a smokescreen, don't they? Well, they always use religion. Uh, religion is a perfect smokescreen because you can say whatever you're doing, you're doing for God, and who could uh, criticize you for that? Well, that seems to be what's happened then. Oh, yeah, and, exactly what happened. Well, and I also understand that uh, there, there are nonsensical uh, ideas that they want to uh, reestablish the Temple Mount uh, after they've consolidated their power in the Middle East. Uh, oh, they certainly do. All those plans are in that formation right now. They are. Oh, yes. And to reestablish that Temple Mount to who welcomed the Rothschilds to the leadership role in that area? Well, the Rothschilds have... Then it had the leadership role in that area in 1880. The whole idea of a Jewish homeland in Palestine was financed by the Rothschilds uh, from uh, Vienna in, in 1880. See, there was never a penny put up by the Jewish community itself for uh, settling in Palestine because the Jews were very happy in Europe. They had no reason to go to Palestine. If you're living in a beautiful modern city, why would you want to go live in a desert? <laughs> I mean, they're not crazy. Well, that makes sense, and, and, and a desert, in fact, that is uh, being fought over. Oh, yes, still being fought over because it's still the crucial area of the world. You control Europe and Asia from that area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So geopolitically, it makes sense. It doesn't make sense from economic sense. It doesn't make sense even from geography. You have to know uh, uh, geopolitics political uh, goals in order to understand what's going on with that. And the American people have no conceptions of geopolitics whatsoever. Yeah, it, 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 that's pretty evident. Now, let's go, to, let's go to Myron Fagan's work here. He actually does a chronology or, or, a, or a, a timeline, as it were, for what he describes, not, not Zionism. He describes it more as, uh, as the Illuminati or these consul on foreign relations but aren't these just um, creations of the same Zionist uh, leadership? Oh, yes. Uh, the Illuminati and Freemasons all came out of the Rothschilds in uh, Vienna, Austria. And, uh, well, uh, Myron was trying to focus on the conspiratorial angle of the thing. He was a very brilliant man and one of the finest people I ever met in my life. Uh, he was the, the only person for years who would promote my uh, Federal Reserve book which appeared in 1953, and it was really immediately in uh, the Anti-Defamation League of Dave Breath unleashed a uh, national campaign against the book. Uh, they labeled it as, as virulently anti-Semitic and myself as the worst anti-Semite in history. So they never quit. They're still saying what they said in 1953, that my book is anti-Semitic, and people read it, pick it up and read it, they can't find an anti-Semitic word in it, so it really puzzles them. But Byron went against the whole establishment because he was an honest man and he believed in what he was doing, and he did it all his life. I, I, I knew him.